This week on My Global Adventure. We were like attacked by a lion last night. <laughs> we had been sick, we had been tired, we had gone through all the rigmarole of travel, and it was like, oh, can something just be flat out just fun, like just fun? And hallelujah, out came Tanzania, and which, oh, it was just fun. We've officially shaken the Egyptian dust from our sandals and moved south to Tanzania. After a week of having to doubt the honesty of almost everyone around us, Tanzania is a refreshing change. It is truly beautiful, particularly here at the edge of the Ngorongoro crater. This crater used to be a volcano, even taller than Kilimanjaro, and it collapsed. That's the theory, anyway. Now it's this big, giant crater. Right now, we're setting up camp not far from the crater. This is the first stop in an adventure chosen specifically for us by the My Global Adventure web audience. My bed for the night. Uh, we tented right on the edge of the crater, a whole bunch of other people, and which was cool, as we got to sort of talk to other people that were there, and it kept us from being separated from the fact that we were in the wilderness, we were in the thick of it. It's a mighty chilly night. I'm not looking forward to warming that bed up at all. But we're not complaining because we just spent a week in Egypt and it was hot without fail, so. All right, everyone. Good night. If the hyenas don't get me, I'll see you tomorrow. And the mist is so thick, you get wet. 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 After a hearty breakfast, our guide Umroso is taking us on a safari into the Ngorongoro crater itself. This is the Vienna sausage. <laughs> the Ngorongoro crater is considered the eighth wonder of the world with walls as high as 900 meters and a giant valley floor 235 kilometers square. It has been compared to Noah's Ark and the Garden of Eden, all rolled into one. And as the sun came up, the cloud, it was like pouring over the edge of the crater. And it, it would sort of retreat and, and come back over these, the edge of this thing. It was, it was beautiful. I was thinking, okay, this is good enough. Even if we don't see any wildlife, this is good enough because it's so beautiful. We drove into the Ngorongoro crater and we were there a minute or two and we came around a corner. There was an elephant, like right beside us. And it was so close. I really didn't think that we would get that close to anything. And it sort of set the mood for the rest of the day because it turned me into a five-year-old kid. It's a big giant ephalant. Seem like very effective camouflage. Oh my god! I don't know why they're so my favorite. They're just that's oh, just awesome. Like what on earth was Mother Nature thinking? I don't know why they're my favorite, and I don't know why I was so excited to see them. They just was, and there they are, live and in the wild. And they're every bit as cool as I thought they would be. 
I swear I am like a kid at Christmas, pointing and oh my goshing all over the place. Amoroso has been a guide for 10 years, and I'm sure he's seen it all, but even he can't help giggling at me. Bunch of them coming on over. Ladies and gentlemen, we have lions. Wow, I'm more than a little nervous right now. Mm -hmm. We ate already, thanks. Mm -hmm. Won't they get mad that we're getting near their food? <laughs> hey, what does Simba mean? In... It means lion? Wasn't Disney invented there? <laughs> the day that we spent at Ngorongoro Crater, I felt like I was allowed to be six and just have fun and just be overwhelmed and excited and awed by the world, by this planet and, and everything that lives in it. That's awesome. Egypt was so hard on everybody anyway. We had been sick, we had been tired, we had gone through all the rigmarole of travel, and it was like, oh, can something just be flat out just fun, like just fun? And hallelujah, out came Tanzania, and which, oh, it was just fun. Lions and elephants yelling, and I was laying there, completely freaked out. And I thought, okay, if I survive this, this is gonna be the coolest night of my whole life. Last night we pitched our tents in the middle of Tarangiri National Park. It's this huge wildlife preserve in the Tanzania lowlands. I swear it was like sleeping in a giant zoo. Morning. Morning. We were like attacked by a lion last night. There was a lion? There was a lion? Maybe I'm like four. Like, I don't even know. How close would you guess that thing was? Yeah, really close, really close to our tent. Anyway, it was about, I don't know, maybe two in the morning or something. I took the bathroom so bad and I wasn't going to get out of my tent. Forget it. It was so scary. There was like lions and elephants yelling and I was laying there completely freaked out. And I thought, okay, if I survive this, this is going to be the coolest night of my whole life. And we survived it. So it's officially the coolest night of my whole life. And I'm going for a run, I think. Anything that was going to follow the Ngorongoro crater was going to have to be pretty spectacular. So I couldn't have picked anything better than uh, Terengiri National Park. We were camping right in the park, in the center of wildlife. And that became evident to us by the fact that as soon as we drove in, we turned a corner and there was this family of like eight giraffe just standing on the side of the road. What am I doing sitting down? We have a roof. Giraffes are one of the only two things that we missed yesterday. Giraffes and rhinos. Are we going to get a rhino today? No, Not get a one. No There's no rhinoceros here? No. You know what? We're just going to have to come back to Africa then. One bonus on the trip through Terengiri is the chance to get to know Umroso a little better. If you've been doing this for 10 years, yeah. you must have some stories. Well, I've seen some interesting things here. Yeah. Um, like one time in the crater, um, we saw a lion trying to, well, five lions trying to kill a buffalo, and they didn't succeed. 
was a big buffalo and there were two young males and three females. And um, one young male jumped on the back of the buffalo, tried to bend the neck, and um, he didn't succeed. Uh -huh. We watched that for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes. Really? And the buffalo would succeed to get out of there. Oh Buffaloes are very tough to kill. Wow. Lions kill them, but they're tough to kill. Amrosa takes us to one of the local watering holes where zebras and wildebeests hang out together. It's kind of a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of relationship. Um, zebras has got very good eyesight, while wildebeest doesn't have good eyesight. Mm. Wildebeest can smell good by smelling. Even uh, like Serengeti when they migrate to Mara and you know, in different places, uh, it's, they can smell the rain. From far away, they will turn around and go this way. Really? Yeah, but eyesight are not good. So they pair up. Mm -hmm. But zebra has got very good eyesight. So when they stay together, they can see predators from far and they will start moving. Smart union. When we got back to camp, nothing had been packed up because the guys had to hide from a herd of invading elephants. Now, that's a story you're not going to get back in Canada. After the elephants finally allow us to pack, we head for Maasai country. And word has it that Maasai men drink blood, fresh blood. I guess I'm going to find out for sure tomorrow. Do you ever get that feeling you're being watched? It's funny how that happens sometimes. We are on our way to Longido, the Maasai village not far from where we camped for the night. So that's why everything is... My guide is Ali Mwako, who has been working for more than 10 years to try to help integrate Maasai culture and tourism into a win-win situation. Tourists are charged a fee to visit a Maasai village, but their activity is strictly regulated by people like Ali. The money is used directly for improvements to the Maasai lifestyle, so villagers are genuinely open and welcoming to visitors. Now uh, <laughs> you have to touch their heads when you're greeting them this morning. Touch their heads? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Hello. <laughs> How about you? Yeah. <laughs> they retain their sense of dignity while, while welcoming us in, which is something that we haven't necessarily seen all along on the trip. Sometimes it's almost, you feel like they're, you're being sold a culture. They're selling their own culture for the sake of the tourist dollar. I didn't get that impression with the Maasai. I had the impression that they're very proud of their culture and very well grounded in their history and so when we met them we could meet them unguarded and we could meet them as people person to person they were as interested in who we were as we were in who they were yeah oh okay yeah the maasai are one of a few tribal cultures that have actually managed to preserve their heritage and traditions in the face of a rapidly changing world it's still a patriarchal society where polygamy is widespread and women play a subservient role so that's why you see a woman is doing a lot of work in the Maasai community. Mm -hmm. To taking care of the infants, to construct the houses, to try to find food for the family, that's a woman work. To buy the uniform for those who are attending classes, uh -huh. to pay the school fees. Oh my gosh, yes. okay. Yes, only funny enough. <laughs> nowadays, the roles of men and women in Maasai culture is another example of where if you read it in a book and you take it theoretically, it's very easy to take a feminist stance on it, but once you actually experience the culture, it's a different thing. <laughs> Where's my translator? Hello, I think I'm losing my watch. <laughs> I was really impressed with the fact that the women seemed to hold a powerful amount of dignity. Uh, and I was thinking that if you're sort of sold as property and there's a whole bunch of you to each man, you're kind of going to feel like property. And uh, they didn't. They, they were individuals and they were very strong, very sort of solid kind of uh, a presence to be around. Once the women are done, what's left for the men to do? Yeah, the men when they have, uh, already have a number of cows. 
you see they can just relax, counting the number of cows when they are getting out for a grazing and also recounting when they are coming back. The Maasai culture, as well as the economy, centers around their cattle, which provide most of their needs. The milk, the meat, the hides, and of course, the blood. The Maasai often drink the blood of their animals. They believe it to be a source of good health and renewed energy. The color of the blood is also predominant in the clothes they wear. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maasai men are very well cared for throughout their lives. Each man can have as many wives as he likes, and I'm told that some even lose track of how many children they have. So this is going to be your husband today. <laughs> <laughs> I got enough work to do, thanks. <laughs> the Maasai way of life is simplistic, but it's far from simple. So much of their lives are based on stability rather than change. But instead of atrophying, the culture is strong, well-grounded, and it has managed to keep its identity in a world that seems to be running headlong into an identity crisis. There are always two sides to every story. With the Maasai, they had such an incredible strength of character, and they were so grounded in their culture, and it made for them having a real sense of who they were. I have always wanted to grasp change to the point where I'm not really connected to my culture or my history or my background. And consequently, I don't have a very good idea of who I am. And I'm certainly not very well grounded in the idea that I have. With Maasai, you're born into something, you stay with something the whole way. Seeing that the Maasai held on to that and seeing that what made them so solid is what I so easily threw away it made me stop and think about what it was I was throwing away and why. Mama Anna, you're a brave woman. I haven't showered in five days. <laughs> <laughs> Mama Anna was so joyful and so bubbling over with joy, I thought, this lady has got to be a hoax. Um, <laughs> this has got to be because we're paying her well or something. I don't know that anyone can be this happy. I'll wear the kanga, but I'm not dancing. <laughs> Kilimanjaro, if there is any image of Tanzania familiar to the world, this is it. Tanzania's second highest mountain is Mount Meru. It's often overlooked, but its slopes are home to a very special program and a very special woman. About 1,500 meters above sea level is the village of Mulala. Most of the villagers are subsistence farmers who grow coffee, bananas, and other fruits and vegetables. One particular residence has built a reputation for making cheese. Her husband Ishmael is kind enough to take me on a tour. This is where they make the cheese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ishmael's wife, known to the locals as Mama Anna, makes traditional handmade cheese she sells in the area and to visitors. Up to 65. She's also a driving force behind the Agape Group, a community of women who support each other's economic activities. It's all part of Mulala's own multicultural tourism project. Asante <laughs> Sana. <laughs> Mama Anna was so joyful and so bubbling over with joy, I thought, this lady has got to be a hoax. Um, <laughs> this has got to be because we're paying her well or something. I don't know that anyone can be this happy. <laughs> wow. She really, really was that happy. And she really genuinely offered the love that she had to us. And I thought, that is something I'm going to remember forever. Oh, that looks so good. Bread making is another of many homegrown projects supported by the group. Kitchens don't have electricity here, so cooking is actually powered by methane gas from cow manure. Now that is what I call recycling. Profits from the Agape Center go directly back to the community to help build things like classrooms and hospital dispensaries. There's no fluff here, folks. This group is the real thing. Did you know, did you know that 
Ishmael and Mama Anna have been married for 26 years. Look at how happy they still are. That's because he pays the bills and she's allowed to cut the cheese. <laughs> Good. It's it's excellent. <coughs> Nzuri. Nzuri. Okay. Mm -hmm. Swahili. I think it's a natural outcome if you're a loving, generous kind of person that everything you touch turns into that kind of gold. And what Mama Anna was doing was really simple, it was really basic, but it was working and it was helping and it was connecting people in a community. And I think that's a natural outcome of the fact that Mama Anna was who she was. She was such a kind, genuine, giving person. And it showed up in the fact that what she was doing was really helping the community and helping the environment. <laughs> I think Tanzania gave me an opportunity to stop focusing on me so much and on my interaction with other people or other cultures or the intensity that had come from some of the other cultures that we had come into. I had a chance to really see the planet, a, a, a beautiful ecological part of the planet that I had never seen before and to appreciate it with like a childlike admiration for, oh my gosh, how beautiful is this country? How beautiful is this planet? It made me a lot more conscientious about what I overlook and what I use too much of and what I'm gonna pay a little bit more attention to from now on. Coming up on My Global Adventure. All right, now we're all in jail. And we went through so much that they have every right in the world to be bitter and angry and vindictive about, but they're not. 